Hi, and welcome to Scientists Warning TV. I'm Alison Green, and today I'm really pleased to have with me two scientists, both ecologists, um, working on the climate and ecological crisis. Um, so we have Dr. Aaron Thierry from Cardiff University, and Aaron received his PhD in ecology from the University of Sheffield, and then subsequently researched the impacts of global warming on the carbon cycle in Arctic ecosystems at Edinburgh University. And his studies have led him to be very concerned about the potential impacts and of disruptions to our climate. And um, we also have Dr. Charlie Gardner from Kent University. Charlie's an interdisciplinary researcher, a conservationist and an activist with a particular interest in societal responses to the climate and biological biodiversity emergencies. From, 20, from 2005 to 2015, he was based in Madagascar where he worked with the World Wildlife Fund and other NGOs on the country's ambitious Durban vision to triple the extent of the protected area network. So welcome to you both. It's great to have you both here today. So thank you. Um, so over the past few months, I've been talking to a number of scientists and academics who have concerns and who are researching in the area of the climate and ecological crisis. And a question that I'm putting to everyone is, how did you how did you get into this line of work? And I think for you two in particular, because you've kind of changed lanes in that you're both academics and you're also activists and environmental advocates. So perhaps starting with you, Aaron, if you could say a little bit about your personal journey into the yeah. activism sphere. Sure. Um, I probably have to go back to my childhood really to, st to start with. <laughs> um, I grew up in a in a um, household that was always very aware about these issues, and also um, I had a kind of a. Um, both my grandmothers were very involved in in um, their community campaigning and, and activism, um, and I think I think that just rubbed off on me in the sense that I kind of grew up with it and understanding that I should be trying to to uh, use my voice in the world to try and create a better world. So that was something I kind of feel quite idealistically about growing up. But also um, I grew up uh, very aware about environmental issues because my mum was an environmental science teacher. Uh, so I kind of always had this in the background and uh, it was always part of me. Um, but in terms of when it started myself, um, it was really at university as a student. Uh, I, I joined up with one of the student uh, uh, organizing protest groups um, and it was mostly focused on trying to make our campus Greener, uh, so focusing on things like um, you know trying to ban bottled water sales on campus and quite small things like that really. Um, and I was also quite interested in kind of working uh, on and campaigns uh, at the time to um, to prevent uh, reforms to tuition fees and things being brought in. So I think I became quite uh, aware of like the power of activism, the need for activism through that. But it wasn't really that I started being an activist on on climate in a big way until um, I think it was. The, the launch of the divestment movement campaign in, in 2012-13 when Bill McKibben uh, wrote his Do the Math article and um, you know just going through those numbers as a scientist really aware of what it actually meant that there was so much more <laughs> fossil fuels uh, on the books of the fossil fuel companies and we could afford to burn if we if we want to meet our climate targets and that was just after the, the collapse of the Copenhagen talks as well not long after that and there was a kind of like a real feeling that you know maybe when I was younger, I would have thought, well, the governments have got this under control. You know, there's people in, you know, who are taking action on this. I think it was that point really that I felt, no, this problem is completely out of control. No one's really getting to grasp with this. And I felt at that point that that was something I really wanted to dedicate my time and efforts to. So yeah, it's about 10 years ago that I kind of really started getting involved in this. That's really interesting. And we'll pick up on that, that sense you got that governments have got things in hand but actually you found they hadn't. Mm. So Charlie, can you say a little bit about your, your own journey into, into activism? So my involvement's a lot more recent than Aaron's. Um, and in fact, my, my path has been quite different perhaps to many academic activists in that I've, I've not been a career academic. I didn't really, um, you know, I went to university, but didn't, didn't go back there to start my PhD until, until I was in my 30s. I have always been first and foremost a conservationist, a conservation practitioner rather than a conservation scientist. So my objectives have always been very practical ones. What can I do to help ensure the conservation of, of, of ecosystems and species? And so 
science was only ever one possible tool that was available to me there. And I, I, um, I fell into academia for, for a number of reasons, not least because I really enjoy research. Mm. Um, I was I was a little involved in anti-capitalist movements, anti-globalization movements um, when I was young as a teenager in the 90s. But then I moved away from from activism, largely because I was working abroad. You know, you know most global biodiversity is in tropical low income countries. And that was that was where my background was. As you said, I spent a lot of time. Um, living in Madagascar, and I, I just wasn't involved in activism at all. Um, but I'd always had this nagging feeling that conservation wasn't enough. Conservation addresses the symptoms mm. of the ecological crisis. It doesn't address the drivers. And, you know, even as a young child wanted to get into conservation, I, I, I was fully aware that there had to be a parallel movement addressing the drivers. And and conservationists don't really do that. They think, oh, that's that's environmentalism. That's that's something else. Um, so ba basically, it was it was when Extinction Rebellion popped up um, in late 2018, and I started. Um, I first heard of them through George Monbiot. I, I, I wasn't. Um, I didn't have my fingers in activist circles, so so I wasn't aware of XR until they were um, in the public. Um, and as soon as I heard of him, I realized I just felt that this is the movement I've been waiting my entire life for. I've, I've you know, just been waiting for the day when you know, the general public cared so much ab ab about biodiversity and, and the living planet that they would take to the streets to fight for it. Um, and so from, yeah, I was just all in from when I first heard of it. And, and, and to me, you know, any... There was never any question of, of considering whether this was a wise thing for me to do as, as an academic, because my, my objective is not my academic career. My objective is to have an impact. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I was very attracted to, to XR when I first heard. So, yes, yeah, so both interesting journeys into activism from academia, um, for sure. And, and I think there was something and still is something quite inspiring about about XR and about its um, its ambition and and its appeal and also in terms of, you know, what it's actually achieved in such a, a short space of time. Um, I'd like to move on now to where we currently are in terms of what's happening. And I think you both rightly point out that there's a lot of emphasis on um, climate and carbon emissions and net zero and so forth. Um, but we have to remember, I mean, I always try to be clear that it's a climate and ecological emergency. It's not just climate. Um, but that being said, th there are, you know, there are, for the, for the average person, I think there's some confusion as to what's actually happening because on the one hand, we see the, we hear optimistic messaging from governments. In fact, we're hearing that at the moment this week you know, with Johnson and Co in the UK talking about, you know, more ambitious targets and, you know, the Biden um, discussions taking place with China at the moment as we speak, and we've got COP26 leaning in November. So there's a lot of um, talk and a lot of talk about ambitious targets. But at the same time, I, like you, have these nagging concerns about the facts. And so, for example, the, um, the International Energy Authority have, have um, this week, I think, or just in the most past few days, announced that carbon emissions are set to be, were set for a record rise in carbon emissions over 2021. Um, and in a context where we've got 101 Nobel laureates calling for um, fossil fuels to be left in the ground, this, 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 this doesn't seem to stack up. So I wondered from your perspectives, how you reconcile the ambitious targets and the goodwill messaging on the one hand with the reality and you know what you see um charlie perhaps start with you um well i, I think you're absolutely right to say that there is a chasm between um what people are talking about and action on the on the ground actual change to how our economies are run but i think it's important to recognize um that the fact that 
people that lots of people are talking about this and setting ambitious targets is an important first step. It's not enough. It's mm. too slow, but it is an important first step. And I, I firmly believe that it has been in large part brought about by activism. I mm. think, um, of course, it's been, you know, scientists have been have, have been talking about this um, and those that work directly in those um, specific policy spheres have been talking about this for, for um, a couple of decades now, but the public weren't, the media weren't, and politicians weren't, and they now are. So I'd just like to, to make that point that, you, you, you know, activism has been, I think, demonstrably successful over the last couple of years. Nevertheless, at this stage, it is all just talk, and I think um, you're, you're, you're right. Yeah, all, all the real world indicators are not just getting worse, but getting rapidly worse and you know, surprising us with the pace at which they are getting worse. The, there has been, um, you know, you, you talk ab about rises in emissions. Um, when it comes to, to climate, the ultimate measure is not emissions, but, but atmospheric concentrations of mm. greenhouse gases. And they're, you know, the the rises, the, the, the paces of, of the increase over the last couple of years have surprised um, scientists. The dip as the global economy shut down during 2020 due to the pandemic um, turned out to be very minor and um, impermanent. So I, I, I think th there is... Um, yeah, there, 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 there's a huge, huge gap between the rhetoric and the reality. And that just serves to highlight the importance of further activism and further action now. Um, you know, we have, we have got people to make commitments. We now have to get them to implement those commitments. Um, the, the other thing I think is that I think the focus currently is, is a bit narrow. We mm -hmm. talk about... Um, we talk about decarbonization, but lots of it is focused on um, a narrow set of sectors. So, you know, energy, energy generation, um, but not things like um, construction and agriculture. And I think we need to um, part part of the reason why there is a, a perhaps this lack of progress is this this search for simple solutions. Um, the, right, we just need to electrify everything and everything will be fine. But um, it's it's just not going to be that simple. You know, we need to change everything. And the other thing, as you pointed out, is we need to, it's, it's not just a climate crisis. It's an ecological crisis. And these two things feed into each other hugely. We can't address one without the other. Um, and perhaps this is something uh, Aaron will speak a little bit more about. But I'm, you know, one of my concerns actually as not just as a conservationist but as a climate campaigner is that a singular focus on on climate or a singular focus on greenhouse gas emissions um will detract from you know a, a holistic approach which that we require we need to absolutely transform every sector of every economy in every country and it's not just a case of um stopping you know burning coal Aaron, would you like to come in here? Yeah, I mean, I think you've you've highlighted the exact issue, which is that the, this gaping hole between the kind of the politics of the situation as it is now and, and the kind of the physical reality on the other hand, and the fact that mm. there's just, you know, they're still miles apart. And we've got to somehow bridge that as quickly as we as, as possible. And I think as, as we're all, all on the call would agree, it's activism that's going to help us bridge that. But um I think I would definitely echo what Charlie says. I would say, you know, you need these targets in a sense to be there <laughs> and, uh, and you need the rhetoric to be there in order to, um, you know, hold people accountable. And, and, you know, it's much better that we have these targets in place, uh, you know, to say so that we can point to them and say, this is what you've said that you're going to be doing. Where's the evidence? What are you actually doing? So, you know, we can use that uh, um, to hold uh, leaders to account. And that's really important. Um, I guess I, I think I, I would agree that, um, you know, one of the things we really need to be on our guard to is, um, you know, um, greenwash and, and kind of false promises. And 
And I think, you know, that's particularly from certain types of industry, but also from government. And, you know, they're all trying to paint themselves as global leaders. Uh, and yet when you dig into the details, often, um, uh, you know, things don't look nearly as, as good. So I think we really need scrutiny. And I think mm. something that academics can bring to this discussion <laughs> is that kind of academic rigor and research to kind of look behind the kind of the, these kind of pretty statements and actually, uh, you know, show where, where there are these real gaps. Um, so, for example, I think when we look at, say, uh, the UK government's pledges and, and their targets, mm. um, you know, a lot of that is because we're not counting the, uh, uh, the emissions of the products that we consume and then ship in from other countries. So, so you know, if we actually use accounted for those in, in our, uh, you know, footprint, that's kind of within the UK's uh, emissions, then actually we, we would be uh, still having not reduced emissions nearly as much as the government are, are kind of patting themselves on the back for. So I think um, it's things like that. And, and another really crucial one is around equity, right? So, so um, the UK has said that we're going to uh, um, reduce emissions uh, uh, by, like, by 2050 to zero or net zero. Uh, and that's really important. That net is doing so much work right now. <laughs> so I think like, we have to constantly say, what do you mean by net? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the kind of the way in which they, they hide the reality of the situation is by, by putting in assumptions like that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, is it really right that the UK, Europe, America, uh, et cetera, take the lion's share of the remaining carbon budget and leave nothing for the rest of the world? Because effectively mm -hmm. that's what we're doing using the targets that we've set ourselves. So um, I think all of these things, you can start to say, you know, these targets are great, but when you dig into them, they start being problematic. And I think that's kind of what I would uh, kind of flag flag there. Charlie? Yeah, if I could just add to that. I think another respect in which these targets are problematic is that they use inappropriate timeframes. And we've seen this very clearly with the UK um, government setting a decarbonisation target of 2050 mm -hmm. and then licensing a coal mine, a new coal mine to operate until the end of December 2049. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk um, about what are appropriate um, targets from a scientific point of view from a technical point of view. But the transitions we're embarking on are social processes. They are not scientific processes. Um, and so these targets, they might be um, you know, defensible, po you know, potentially defensible from a, a strict carbon accounting point of view, but they neglect the fact that if you give someone until 2045 to do something, they're not going to start now. And of course, this is um, and that applies to to anybody. You know, we put things off as individuals, but it's even more the case for a politician tasked with difficult decisions. And, you mm -hmm. know, this is going to be a hugely challenging and difficult transition. And it's scary for mm -hmm. decision makers to have to make difficult decisions. Um, but by having these targets, by saying we need to do this till 2050, as far as I can see, that's just a license for the people in charge now, whether that be of um, a government, a corporation, or you know, a, a public body like a university. What that says is, oh, my, my successor is going to have a really difficult time, but actually I can avoid the difficult decisions. I can, I can make the commitment, um, bask in the adulation for having taken the courage to make this brave step but actually it's not a brave step because you're not going to be the one implementing it you're exactly right and that 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 short termism in a sense is very um it's a kind of seductive tool isn't it that politicians use just to, to to kick a problem into the long grass because as in any sphere difficult decisions are avoided aaron yeah i just wanted to add one other thing as well which is um, you know, are the targets about the right thing, uh, generally? <laughs> so, so um, you know, we can have as many, uh, you know, new uh, sources of renewable energy built and constructed, mm. which is great, and we need it. But, but 
uh, and, and politicians love talking about the renewable energy that they've been producing and how many more wind farms have been produced, et cetera. But actually what matters is, as you said, how, how much fossil fuels we're burning and how much the, the concentrations are building up in the atmosphere. And so if, um, you know, we, we can build renewable energy, but if we keep bur burning fossil fuels, then we're not solving the problem. Uh, it just feels like we're solving the problem. So, so I think what we really need to be thinking, uh, as, as you said earlier on, is how do we leave the fossil fuels in the ground? That should be the, the focus. And, and obviously to do that, we need to build renewable energy, but the focus has to be on challenging government about what are they doing to leave fossil fuels in the ground. And right now the UK government, as Charlie is saying, still potentially green lighting a coal mine expansion, still uh, you know, encouraging uh, oil drilling in the North Sea, mm -hmm. still um, financing uh, uh, gas terminals off the coast of Mozambique. All of these things um, are, are being done by our government who claim to be a world climate leader. And, and so there's this kind of real cognitive dissonance in the, in the dialogue that they, that they are using. And I think the public need to kind of really be, be skeptical and, and, and hold them to account and point out these contradictions. I think it's a very good point. And it's a, it's a, a profound concern of mine that, you know, that the talk that we see on the news, for example, um, is about progress towards these net zero targets. And yet I think in the context where you have a public relatively uneducated about the nuances of net zero, because it's another accounting trick, just as carbon offsetting and all of these are. Um, they they lend themselves to all sorts of um, practices that, that 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 aren't helping us in terms of achieving the the goal we want to achieve. Um, and I think I think you're right in terms of you know the, the need to transition. And I think that the one of the few articles I've seen that actually talks about the transition is is Julia Steenberger and her colleagues talking about, there was actually a scientist warning on affluence paper, but really talking about something else to replace GDP, you know, an index of um, well-being, living well. And, and that in a sense, if, if we could shift to something like that, I think it would be less frightening to both the public and politicians, you know, that we can live well with less, you know, which is the bottom line, I think. Um, and moving on, I wonder whether some of this, you know, the, the fact that education is crucial. Michael Mann in his, his extremely good book, The New Climate War, talks about this education, education, education. And if we all were aware of what was happening, then perhaps we'd make different decisions and different choices, which kind of brings me to the next point, which is, you know, all three of us are academics, you know, of one kind or another. And I quit academia because I felt it was failing us. And I think there is a, there is a question here about the responsibilities of academics. And I wondered if you might both want to speak to that. What, what are the responsibilities of an academic and a scientist and an academic leader in a time of climate and ecological emergency? Um, who wants to, who'd like I'll, to start? I'd, I'd like to say something straight away, actually. Okay. <laughs> so I, think, I, think, I think, I guess it's cause we're academics. Um, but we like to see that the world is is uh, rational and and uh, it, it's explained by uh, information and evidence and uh, and also we like to th we often are people who've succeeded in education and, and we value education and we you know that, that's our identity um, and so we put an awful lot of emphasis on the need for education so much of um, uh, I think academics kind of you know, say, well, that's our job, right? Our job is to do research, produce information, share that information, job done, we can draw the line there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact is, information is not enough. Education is not enough. Um, mm -hmm. the, the point is, we've been talking about these things, researching these things for, for decades, and seeing very little change uh, in direction of, of, of where we're headed, because just telling people uh, that there's a problem, just warning people there's an issue, mm -hmm. is not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, um, that's become very clear to me. And I think one of the things that I feel is like, you know, it's not just enough to know something, you have to act as though you, you understand it and that you, you're consistent with what you know. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that for me means uh, acting in order to try and bring about the changes to decarbonize society and, and putting pressure politically to do that. Um, but that comes from the knowledge that I have, but, but it, it, it's not enough just to have that knowledge, right? I've got to do something with it. And I think academics, as a whole um, need to start thinking, well, what is it that we're doing with this research? How are we uh, um, contributing uh, to, to bringing about the, the changes that we've, based on what we've learned? 
Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think that's one of the things I'd just like to say straight, straight away is like, you know, we, we have to kind of recognize that we have to go beyond just, just informing people. Um, yeah. Charlie, do you want to come in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I strongly agree with that. I think, um, yeah, academic, academia um, has a, a sort of unspoken mission, or perhaps it is spoken, perhaps, it, uh, um, you know, th this is more widely known than I'm aware of, but it has this unspoken mission to contribute to public goods, to make mm. the world a better place. And many researchers um, yeah, become academics for this reason. Um, because, you know, knowledge is good and knowledge makes the world a better place. Education is good. The thing is, we are in an emergency now. And I really, I love the use, the very deliberate use of this word emergency by um, Bill Ripple and friends in mm. the scientist warning community in, in their papers, because it's a word with very deep implications. It, it highlights um, the, the urgency in terms of time but it also suggests that what we're currently doing isn't sufficient. In an emergency, you stop what you're doing and you focus on the urgent task at hand. Now, when we think of, of sort of academia's theory of change, how does academia contribute to make the world a better place? Well, it's through research. And Aaron has already pointed out that that theory of change is um, based on false assumptions, because governments don't listen to scientists, governments listen to lob corporate lobbyists. Mm. Um, but it's also, you know, that theory of change is also inadequate in an emergency context, purely because of the time frame. Now, there's, there's, it takes several years for research to translate into policy, even if, yeah, that's if it ever does translate into policy. It takes a whole generation for um, students to adopt leadership positions. Mm -hmm. We don't have this time available. We need to act now. So I think, um, yeah, the, the regardless of what our um, obligations, our, 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 our duties as academics are, the fact that we are in an emergency context changes them. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, oh, no, sorry, I completely forgot my second point. <laughs> um, Don't worry. I, I, I completely agree with that. And I think one point I would say is, you know, Bill Ripple has worked on um, scientist warning articles for, for quite some time now. And I think for him in particular and the authors of those papers, it, and, and for those of us associated with it, it's absolutely galling that in November 2019, when the climate emergency paper made global headlines, nothing happened. Now, in part, I think that was because we had the coronavirus was just literally around the corner. Um, but even if we hadn't had the coronavirus around the corner, I can't help but feel that there was, that nothing was going to happen as a consequence, as a consequence of those, you know, of, 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 of that significant act of thousands and thousands of scientists, a lot of them ecologists, saying this is a climate emergency. And it's frustrating, I think, for academics because there are no current systems and processes in place that say, um, once you've published your article and were given your presentation or written your book, your obligations then are to ensure that X, Y, and Z happens. That, that's not written into any academics contract. There's no expectation on the part of academics to embrace a wider kind of responsibility for the knowledge and scholarship that they've generated. And so therefore, you're right, I think, Charlie, you know, we have to ask of academics and ask of, of, of all of us ourselves, what, what is it that we now must do? What are we morally obligated to do? And it's being asked of us as well by our students, I think. Uh, mm. in, but I, I think, one of the things I think is that, um, you know, that paper, it might not have had the impact that you wanted, but I think it did have an impact on, uh, you know, encouraging the social movements to keep going, right? So I think, mm -hmm. you know, the, the one people, group of people who have been listening to, to the scientists' warnings are the people who are out on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
they have got it. <laughs> They've heard the message and, mm. and they're acting according to the warning, right? Mm. So I think for me, um, you know, that's, that shows that these, these, these messages do have a role, they have a significance, but they also, um, I think, um, for me, there's, there's, there is that responsibility that comes with that, right? Because the scientists are the ones who know this better than anybody. <laughs> You know, and with knowledge comes responsibility. And I think we need to be acting. And I think one of the things from a communications point of view, actually, if not just, just, just that, but um, is that it's very easy for people to, to, to dismiss a message from a messenger who is not acting consistently with that message. Mm. So, you know, if a scientist is going, this is, this is a real crisis, everybody, this is an emergency, and that's all they do, <laughs> then the public's, kind of responses well why aren't you doing anything else then <laughs> so so for me i think for to actually land with the public for the public to really get what the scientists are saying the scientists have to be acting as though they believe their own research and that for mm. me means that the scientists have to get involved in in these movements and and push for the changes that we need i, I agree. yeah I Sorry, John, sorry, go ahead. sorry, Alison. I just wanted to to um, agree and and expand on, on Aaron's mm. point there. I think yes, there is that um, there is a real danger um, of not acting um, in a way that's commensurate with what we're saying. But I think the the flip side there's a flip side to that too, and that's that we have particular opportunities as scientists that we don't have as simple citizens. And that's because the public respects us, trusts us, has and has faith in us. And um, to some extent will grant us a platform, will lend us their ears in a way that they might not otherwise. You know, if, if I was just Charlie from Norfolk, I wouldn't be here now. And I would have had much less opportunity to say what I have to say over the last couple of years because I am associated with a university and I have these letters in front of my name. That gives me a platform. And mm -hmm. so there's another there's a second layer of moral obligation there, I think, not just the moral obligation that comes with the knowledge, but the moral obligation that comes with the power to use that knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to take these opportunities. And then, as Aaron says, if, if, if we don't, we're not just missing an opportunity, but we're actually weakening our position. We're making it seem like it's not the emergency it is. Yep, I agree. And, and now I want to bring it. I, I often call this particular constituency the silent villains. And, and by, the, by them, I mean those people who are leading universities, because I feel it's inappropriate to point the finger of blame at, at scientists and academics because I think what they're doing is fulfilling their remit. What hasn't happened is that they have not been um, they have not been given permission to speak and to act. If anything they've been prevented and it's ironic that one of the mechanisms to prevent is actually called prevent. In the UK there's the prevent policy which is supposed to be preventing terrorism but activists are not terrorists. Um, and Vice chancellors um, as a group have been completely silent on this front. They haven't enabled, they haven't given permission to their scientists and academics to speak or to act. They haven't protected them. And I think it's 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 a travesty. It's um it's it's hugely regrettable and it's something that that does need to change. But but as as Charlie says, and you know, those kinds of changes will will take some time. Um and on the point about consistency, I mean, perhaps you'd like to speak to the, uh, you know, the inconsistency, if you like, in terms of universities and their declarations of climate emergency. And yet, you know, they are really very reluctant, to put it mildly, to, to the, you know, to divest from fossil fuels. Of course, you know, we saw the Oxford example recently, and perhaps one of you would like to pick up on, on that. Shall I go? Sure. Uh, okay. Okay. Um... Yeah, so I think there's a huge contradict. Like I think you're you're totally right. I mean, just just quickly on the first part though, mm. I think there is a responsibility still on researchers and academics and scientists to push back, right? Like if they feel they're being stifled mm. and they can't express the things that they need to, then they should be trying to create the space in which they can. Um, we can't just keep saying, you know, we all have responsibilities at whatever level we're mm. at to kind of push for change. Um, but obviously, right, th those people in positions of power, in positions of authority, have have 
even more reason to act uh, or need to act. And um, anyway, but but on, on that point of inconsistency, I think it's 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 crucial, right? We're all so compromised as institutions. You know, mm -hmm. how 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 can a university declaring climate emergency still take money, research funding? from fossil fuels. So, so in that case from Oxford, the new report that came out this week saying, you know, Oxford University has received 11 million pounds in research funding from, from fossil fuel companies mm -hmm. at the same time as they're calling themselves climate leading universities and, and championing their climate research. You know, we've got to break this again, kind of cognitive dissonance that's within these institutions and, and, mm -hmm. and, and actually align ourselves towards uh, actually taking action on these problems in accordance with the emergency that we're in. Mm -hmm. So. I think um, for me, you know, one of the things that I started my activism doing was working with the with the fossil fuel divestment movement, like I mentioned earlier. And so that was about getting universities to stop, um, you know, investing their money in fossil fuel companies. And that, that campaign has grown hugely from, from the students and the staff that kind of mm. kicked them off in various different universities. And, and you know, now half, over half the universities in the UK have now divested from fossil fuels. But some of those are still taking research money from fossil fuel companies, even as they've said that they won't put money in themselves. And I think for me, like it was particularly uh, sad when I was uh, 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 doing my postdoc, I was there researching climate changes impacts in the Arctic. Um, I was uh, part of a, a school of, of academics who were, you know, um, you know, researching the impacts on the biosphere, uh, writing in, in the IPCC, et cetera. Whilst our co colleagues down the corridor were taking money from Total and, and Exxon and so on to go and look for more fossil fuels. And, you know, when we were pushing for the university to reform itself and to be more uh, sustainable and, and to kind of stop investing in fossil fuel companies, those same colleagues of ours were, were pushing back saying, no, we, we need, to, you know, we want to keep getting our funding from these companies. So I think, you know, academics, again, need to look at themselves to look at our institutions and thinking, you know, are we actually part of the solution here? Are we actually, as an institution, working for positive change in tackling the climate emergency? Or are we actually in bed with it? and uh, the forces that are driving it and are reluctant to actually challenge that. Uh, and so actually making the problem, keeping the problem, you know, becoming worse. So I think, you know, where is our, our moral backbone as, as higher education institutions? You know, how, how dare we look at our students in the face and say, we're tackling these issues and, and supporting their future while still, you know, supporting fossil fuel companies and, and other corporations to destroy the planet. It just, it's so inconsistent and we have to challenge that as academics within our institutions. I couldn't agree more. And, and I'm going to say this, you know, there's an example from Aberdeen. I'm, I'm a graduate of Aberdeen University and I'm profoundly ashamed that to this day they um, are um, advertising a course in um, an undergraduate degree in petroleum engineering with the words that there has never been a better time to be a petroleum engineer. I mean, it's it's shocking. It's absolutely disgraceful. Um, sorry, that's my you know that's my my bugbear of the moment. Um, Charlie, and anything from you on on this? Yeah, I just wanted to um, to go back to a point you made right at the the start um, of of this section where you talked about how um, as institutions, academics don't support. Sorry. Uh, Universities don't support their academics in mm -hmm. activism. Um, th this is a discussion uh, um, Aaron and I have been having recently. We actually have a manuscript um, in review talking about this. Um, the, po the, the, the point you made there was talking about how universities don't support us to carry out our activism as citizens. Mm -hmm. We make the point that even that, is not sufficient. You know, earlier I was talking about the power that we have as academics, and yet, even those of us that are academic, uh, that are activist academics, we still relegate the activism part of what we do to our spare time mm -hmm. outside our work hours. And although, al al although we might carry out activism in the persona of an academic, we're doing it on our own time. Um, um, and, you know, I, I'd argue, I'd go further, not just that um, universities should support us to do it on our own time, but they should consider it a core part of our mandate and, you know, allocate some of our time to doing this. Not, not, well, not necessarily activism, but at least advocacy, engaging with um, 
you know, whatever route to, to see you from research to impact. And I think mm. that th this, yeah, this absolutely should be considered a core part of an academic's mandate, not just, you know, as you yourself said earlier, the job isn't done when the paper is published. We really have to change that mindset. Aaron. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways that universities could be taking a lead here, right? Um, so, so for one, the hubs of innovation that, that, you know, we could be prototyping all sorts of new ways of living on campus. Uh, you know, we've got all of the enthusiasm of the students from the youth strikes, you know, they want to see reforms to the curriculum so that they can be trained in the skills that they need. And one of those skills is activism, right? One of the skills that they need to learn is how to be uh, civic uh, citizens that are civically engaged in creating change in our communities, in our society, learning how to, um, you know, lobby governments, how to um, uh, organize rallies and protests in order to pressure people. That's a skill. And it's a skill that, that they should be getting taught at the university and not just on their own time. But, you know, I think students who, who are being taught um, by academics who have the skills and experience of protest will, you know, learn, um, learn exactly what it, what it is that they need to be doing at this time to create the, the really rapid transitions that we need. So I think, you know, th there is an, a case there that actually that's, a, that's something that we should be uh, doing within our institutions, passing the, the, those skills on. I think that's, that is a fantastic point to end on actually um it just brings us you know it, it brings us full circle about what it is academics should be doing and the skills that they need to impart to, to young students um i'd just like to ask you both just for some final words before we before we conclude a fascinating discussion charlie um just just to say i think that um well two things one is that you know, academics are career focused. We, we tend to be very driven people and we tend to be um, quite, quite focused. That, that's why we've got as far as, as, as we have. But I think lots, you know, lots of the, the things that drive us are sort of based on assumptions of a stable world and a future that's going to be the same as the present um that's not the case it's you know this is uh, I'm, I'm convinced the next five years is the most critical period there ever has been in human history or or ever will be um you know, if you want to have the secure future that you've dreamt of as an academic where you are a um, you know, highly respected professor with thousands of citations and, and everyone looks up to you well if you want to have that that future, then there's work that has to be done now. And that work is saving the world. It's not writing more papers. So just, I, I don't know, we just have to just wake up to, 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 to the realities and, and question your assumptions about, about what it is you want from your future. I think we have, as we say, we have great responsibility. We, we, we have great power. And now mm. is absolutely the time to start using that in ways that are effective. Thank you. Mm. Um, Aaron, yeah, no. final words from you? Uh, so I think I would say we've touched on quite a few times in the conversation just how important activism protest is as mm. a, a, a for creating social change. We've talked about the fact that so much of the progress that we've seen in the last few years would not have happened without groups like the youth strikes in particular, but also Extinction Rebellion and, and obviously all the other movements that had come before and all the effort that had, had built up to that. But um, for me, one of the things that's really concerning is that because those movements are successful, there is a big backlash uh, against them. Mm. And we are increasingly seeing, um, you know, well, in the UK, we're seeing a new police uh, sing bill, which is threatening to clamp down on the rights of protest in extraordinary ways. I, mean, I think you know, academics need to make themselves aware of just how outrageous uh, a, a, an assault on civil liberties this, this bill is and, and to try and do everything to, to prevent it. Because if we don't have the, the ability to protest freely in our societies, then we're not going to have any chance of solving the climate and ecological crisis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the idea that, you know, young people uh, out on school strikes who've, who've, who've created this moment of change or the possibility for change are now going to be criminalised for what they've done. 
at this time when it's just, you know, it's so urgent that we have more of, of, of that kind of engagement. It, it's, it's, it's horrific and, and terrifying. So mm. I think, you know, if, if nothing else, become an activist about that, you know, fight for, for the right to protest, fight for the right to free speech, fight for academic freedom. And, and I think those are the things that for me, um, you know, we should all be joined together uh, mm. pushing for that. So um, now, is, now is time for <laughs> everything is to play for right now and, and we need as many people involved as possible. So, you know, please jo join in with the movements and support them in whatever way you can. Thank you. Yeah, I com completely agree. Um, now, now is the time um, for sure. And yes, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's all of our lives. It's all of our futures, you know, those of our children too. So. Thank you. Thank you both so much for a really fascinating discussion and for all the very important points you've made. Super. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us, Alison. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.